This is a Decentered Media vlog with me, Rob Watson. Conversations about community media. Visit decentered.co.uk or follow on Instagram and Twitter at Decentered Media. Hello, uh, Rob Watson here, and I'm out and about this morning in Leicester. Uh, let me just take, uh, I've left my headphones in uh, to have us. Um, and it's warmer today than I anticipated it was going to be, so I think I've got too many layers on. Um, the um, it, It's kind of not as sunny as it has been, but it's still clearly uh, warm, which is nice. Um, what I want to do is just spend a few minutes sharing some thoughts about uh, the what I call the, uh, the some people call it a theory of change or the, the communications model uh, that I uh, develop and work with when I'm planning projects and I'm, I'm working on projects uh, really just to uh, kind of give an overview of how and I'll follow this up by posting it online as well um, and it's kind of bringing together a lot of the categories, the issues, the processes uh, that help me to plan and um, think about how a project using media for community related issues uh, can be uh, structured and can be uh, mapped out and may turn into something which people can actually use. Uh, that's the hard part by the way. So I kind of tend to look at things quite agnostically. So the idea, I've got some notes. Uh, so the, <coughs> excuse me, the idea is that it's, I, I kind of take it as being, our interest is about any kind of form of media which we can use for, uh, or which we use to uh, extend, develop, um, to clarify, whatever it is that we want to do, our sense of community and our, our ability to engage with one another in a way which has a community focus, a community feel. So I call it community focus communications because it's, it's kind of the, the broadest uh, way I can think that we can identify uh, different actions, different patterns of behavior, different tools. Uh, different media forms, different technologies, uh, different expectations about communication, uh, because keep it as broad as we can and look at what the principal aims are. So this kind of brings together a lot of thinking that I've done over the, over, over the years about what the kind of modes of engagement are and how we can measure, clarify, understand them. So it's kind of, there's a number of factors. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a community development model. And development is an interesting word because there's a number of ways that we can think about development. Uh, it isn't just a straightforward idea that you build in resources um, and that you build capacity, but there also has to be a change in people's sense of, of awareness of themselves and their world that they live in and the world in which they communicate to so a sense of their consciousness we have to plan to support and facilitate change in the way that people conceive and are aware of themselves in the world so that developmental approach is both collective and individual as well so the community development models are often uh, asset-based community development for example um, and, there's, and there's lots of other different types of models which um, can often look at the tangible things that are done in a community. So, I don't know, the number of people who can send an email, for example, the number of people who can buy a pair of shoes online, the number of people who can order a prescription online. Often in terms of digital engagement, it's seen as a very functional type of uh, model, but what maybe we're interested in is how people express themselves, how people represent themselves, how people conceptualize themselves, and how that is compared with other people. So there's a three levels. So there's the kind of the intra interpersonal level, 
almost the kind of personal engagement that you have yourself. There's the intrapersonal level, the level that we consider things between one another as a group, as groups. And then there's the uh, extra personal level, which is where we do uh, communication through different groups outside of um, our core um, accepted groups. So um, let me just I'm gonna have a wonder. So the idea is to um, kind of, sh uh, you know, an effective citizen, if you like, would be somebody who could switch between different modes of engagement. So you're able, you're aware of your response to and um, uh, impressions and experience of things yourself. You're aware of, of how that works on a group level and you're aware how that works, how, how that is viewed externally. So we have a, a kind of dynamic often which is presented through mainstream media that you know people, you know, somehow magically are able to present themselves and it gets wrapped up in a lot of impression management, marketing type stuff, where what you're doing is you're managing how you come across, how you present yourself, your persona <coughs> is presented across to people. So part of this process, as well as being a community development process, it's, um, it's a personal development process, um, both individually and collectively. Sorry, I'm walking up some steps and uh, I'm not as fit as I used to be. Um, so the depth psychology approach is something that I've tried to incorporate into this. And rather than looking at this as a series of things that we can track and measure, it becomes something which we can um, think about in terms of things like stories, how you know how we construct and share our story, you know, stories about ourselves, and how we use them to make. It's about sense making, meaning making. I think it's one of the primary differences with this approach is that it puts sense making and meaning making at the core, and. To do that, it's also about um, thinking about things not just on a cause and effect approach, but thinking about it also on, if you like, a mythological level and a symbolic level. So ideas um, don't just have a function within our lives. They represent something which ties in with um, the, well, kind of Jungian psychology calls you know, archetypal uh, patterns and these, these get repeated and you know we live we live out the archetypal um, we, we're not we live out myth we might think in western society that we live in a, a mythless world uh, but it's you know it's an in, in, integrated within our experience and it comes out in fantasies but it also comes out in you know, the way we pigeonhole certain types of behaviour, uh, certain types of people, if you like, who have certain types of characteristics that we uh, draw on, uh, you know, st or sometimes stereotypically draw on a set of criteria which um, have deep roots and have deep cultural roots. And the recognition that those cultural roots can be different and that they are uh, not necessarily um, comparable and that the founding mythologies on which um, the way that we engage with the world and think in the world can be different. Um, so this approach kind of tries to bring some of those, that insight um, together with uh, things like ethnographic study, so action research or participant observation, ethnographic ways of looking at things humanistically and ways of saying this is about what people do. So uh, sociological examination. So uh, don't just look at what the claims are, look at what the actions are is a good piece of advice. Um, also, uh, what brings them together for me is a kind of pragmatic, non-ideological approach, which is founded on, uh, I, I 
kind of like the use of symbolic interactionism, which grew out of um, uh, Herbert Mead's uh, ideas of uh, eth uh, uh, anthropology, <coughs> where you look at society, you look at people as, have, uh, ha as having been defined by certain practices, rituals, relationships, and that these have a meaningful organisation, sense of organisation, which is expressed through things like aesthetically, through things like art and through decoration and clothes and, you know, everything that we do has a meaning that we can read into it rather than it just being a series of exchanges or calculations as we might be expected in some of the more uh, materialistic and uh, transactional and the word I'm looking for is uh, instrumental forms of thinking about human behavior and human nature uh, this you know kind of says we need to tie uh, together that which is without with that which is within uh, there is a reciprocal relationship there is a relatedness between the two elements of our experience and what we're doing is trying to figure out how we conceive and imagine the world with how we practice and do things in the world and what we experience uh, you know externally and how we match that with our our internal uh, presuppositions about that world uh, which kind of is you know it's a challenge to do that because you've got to understand people's behavior on a number of different levels uh, at the same time simultaneously so you're looking at the idea that either our, our lived experience is important as it represents our symbolic uh, engagement with one another but only in the way that we represent that through stories what our language our uh, culture the things that we create and share and, and express ourselves through um, uh, you know that that our thinking if you like is um, comes to us through certain uh, archetypal uh, ways of engaging with the world about time and space and things like that it's kind of a, a Kantian model uh, so in, t in terms of trying to bring this into something which is practical because it can be quite theoretical um, is that it's about um, taking these ideas of thinking of what the conceptual the cultural and if you like the cognitive elements of our engagement are and putting them together with our, and recognising the value of our intuitions and feelings as much as the things that we think about and that we can measure and calculate and uh, that kind of thing. But also putting it into the context of our lived experience and that experience we recognise it as being emergent and we recognise it as being a, an embodied practice. So it's something that we have to, we can't abstract ourselves away from our physical presence we are part of that <coughs> relationship with the world and to only think that we can uh, deal with things purely in conceptual terms is a mistake as well we need to also think about how we feel about things and what our physicality tells us what our sense of being uh, tells us about things and if we don't do this um, then we become an imbalanced and one-sided and we'll, we'll be unable to recognize uh, where the uh, you know the, the, the strengths of our uh, present arrangements lie and where the weaknesses lie and we'll be unable to reflect on them and learn from them um, and that's you know the essential factor is that we're always should be learning uh, our culture should be a well I, I would argue we should be a learning culture and anybody who has dogmatic or fixed views uh, about the world uh, is maybe going to be in for a shock when they find that the world has changed around them as it seems to do. Um, so it's about bringing ideas and concepts together in a kind of symbolic sense but also in an empirical sense. You know, to regard the symbolic as not being an empirical phenomenon is uh, a mistake. The symbolic is equally as important as the physical uh, presence of things <coughs> but we we have to be attuned to the symbolic in a different way than we would be if we are uh, looking at the physical characteristics of our world and environment um, and then we 
kind of think about it through, you know, so we can look at this through um, what Herbert Bloomer calls the line, the lines of entry into society. So, you know, patterns of family organisation, um, how jobs are codified and structured, how money is used, you know, uh, how um, transport and communications are organised. These are, if you like, the uh, the fault line, not the fault lines, the uh, contour lines of a society, um, which changes over time. But as uh, you know, we're looking at a moment, a present moment that we're part of and that we exist in, which we can trace and track um, and try and. Uh, make sense of and then remake sense of it so that we can help other people make sense of it and so it's this you know ongoing dynamic process of change and interchange and also this idea that there's a kind of a you know different level different levels that you can look at this from which is you know you can look at it on a micro level but you can then you know, scale it up to a, a, a meso level, an intermediate level, and then you can scale it up further and look at it at a macro level so you get a more holistic view of this. And you may also think about this in terms of time scale, so, you know, the immediate and present, um, the immediate past and present, the immediate or the, you know, the short-term uh, future, and then the long-term future, which, uh, again, further changes the way that we would expect to plan and develop and think about what our future needs are. And, you know, I think there's good evidence to suggest that certainly, certainly here in the UK, we're not very good at thinking in terms of um, the future. What we tend to do is think in terms of the present and our present responses to things and our immediate needs and what we're not planning ahead for. There's, a, you know, there's the Japanese idea of planning seven generations ahead and when you're looking at social resources and infrastructure you're asking the question what will seven, you know people in seven generations uh, feel uh, or need uh, and so just you know just just focusing on your own personal needs without thinking about future generations or indeed other um, other species who we share the planet with then you're only uh, uh, anticipating a limited worldview. So it's an ecological approach and it's a holistic approach and it's also a moral and ethical approach uh, because you're asking the question, you know, on what basis can we say or do something which is then, uh, you know, more widely applicable. I'm not going to say universally applicable because I think that would be a contradiction in terms, but having the ability to apply and uh, reach a point where you can get agreement at least temporarily on the nature of how we deal with change and modify and manage our behaviour and our, our, our sense of engagement on the basis of uh, our perceptions which are fluid and which are influenced from many different directions and on many different uh, ways. So I'm not sure I've explained it particularly well. One of the interesting things I want to do about this process is to try and uh, use examples and to look at ways that it can be uh, put into a practical context to bring out, you know, the that's all very well in theory, but how does it work in practice question, uh, which I'm a, a big fan of. Um, and also to think about how we, you know, we can evidence this in order to make sure that it's something that we can agree <coughs> agree is a valid approach. Um, so I'm not just saying that this is based on my assumptions and my personal uh, inter interactions, uh, but it's actually got something which can be applied. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it just brings together a couple of models and there are many or many more models that you know it's aligned with that I've not mentioned of evaluation and analysis and it, it the aim is to synthesize this to put this into a, a context which isn't just about being analytical about this approach 
but actually anticipates the idea that it is a <coughs> a synthesis of practice, a synthesis of being, a synthesis of um, engagement, it's a synthesis of all of these factors. And the the you know the argument is that we have to have you know what. That symbolic realm is what enables us to um, encounter that synthesis, that transcendent synthesis. And you know, so we, w what is it that we maybe need to look to and think about that is puts us in touch with that sense of meaning and that sense sense making uh, that enables us to move on and to transcend our present circumstances. So. If you, I'll, what I'll do is I'll post up the uh, the notes on a blog post. If you go to decentered.co.uk, uh, you'll be able to access this and uh, all uh, the other videos I've put in the uh, out in the public. Um, we do have a Patreon uh, account which you can support us from as little as one pound a month. And if you want to get in touch with me on. Uh, social media, it's Twitter and Instagram at Decentered Media. Uh, but thanks for listening, and I'll speak to you soon. And uh, yeah, my, my, my kind of, I'm not really sure it was a pleasant walk through Leicester this morning. You've been watching a Decentered Media vlog with me, Rob Watson. To find out more, go to decentered.co.uk or follow on Twitter and Instagram at Decentered Media.